This episode is brought to you by DistroKid. Do you love catching the latest blockbusters, but you're looking to save some cash? Well, Regal Cinemas has you covered. Introducing the Regal Crown Club, a totally free loyalty program designed to give you more bang for your buck every time you visit the theater. As a Regal Crown Club member, you can rack up points and redeem them for awesome perks such as concession upgrades, movie tickets, and exclusive prizes. Plus, points can be used to shop for merch, score free downloads, and enter sweepstakes in the Regal Rewards Center. But the deals don't stop there! On Mondays, get 25% off all candy, and on Tuesdays, enjoy 50% off popcorn along with discounted movie tickets, as low as $5 with Regal Value Days. Oh, and did I mention they give you a free popcorn every year on your birthday just for being a member? How cool is that? Crown Club also checks every time you buy a ticket, and after just 6 visits, you'll earn free bonus extra credits. So why wait? Download the Regal app today and get started with your free Crown Club membership. Regal Crown Club, your ticket to unbeatable movie deals. Hey everyone, today's guest is Matt Scannell, guitarist and lead vocalist for the Washington DC alternative rock band, Vertical Horizon. Together we pull back the covers and take a deep dive into the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the smash hit single, Everything You Want, taken from their 1999 album of the same name. This song's an interesting one. Having slugged it out for the better part of a decade, Vertical Horizon got signed to RCA Records and wrote Everything You Want. But it wasn't a runaway smash in anyone's mind just yet. At first, everyone from the label and the band felt like it was just another song on the record. It wasn't until a DJ in Alabama started spinning Everything You Want, instead of their official single, We Are, that the track started to catch on. And he wasn't the only one. Other stations followed. The song began to climb, and climb it did. It had one of the slowest ascents to the top of the charts. But after something like six months, it made it to the top and became the band's most well-known song. 25 years later, the track still sounds as awesome as when it was released. So for all this and a discussion on mobile play sets for a baby's crib, don't touch that dial. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Matt, how's it going? It's going great, Chris. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. We were joking before we started recording here, and I know the listeners will maybe see a clip of this when we, we run a reel or so, but I told Matt he made the perfect executive decision back in the 90s when he decided just to, to, to be bald then and accept it and embrace it, because you look exactly the same. Yeah, it, we, we, it was it was a game time decision. I feel like we did well, <laughs> and we're just, we're, 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 you know, we've been living off the benefits of that one call for a very long time yeah but thank you that's kind of you to say chris yeah you you parlayed it into a 30-year career here i love it i, I absolutely love it it was just the baldness it like the it didn't have anything <laughs> to do with anything else it was just like because if I hadn't done that, where would I be? I know. Well, you and Billy Corgan and Ed Ed, <laughs> uh, Ed from Live had the, had a corner on the market. Yeah, Ed Kowalczyk. That's right. That's old, right. Old Ed. But uh, I, I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm oh, excited because I kind of see a little bit of a parallel career here. We're almost the same age. My band started in the early 90s, as yours did. Uh, I know you guys were out there working your tails off, playing every coffee shop and cafe and party and whatever else and, yeah. and you, re- you released a couple records and then you released a, a live album and then you get signed and this yeah. whole time you know you're vertical horizon you're out doing your thing you're a singer songwriter and you're playing you do have fans you don't sell seventy thousand records uh without having some sort of fan base but right. as we all know those those dots have to connect in order to go on to uh, to greater heights as you did but let's talk about this a little bit what really reminded me of this is when I went and, and, and as as I do with these episodes, I don't only, only listen to the studio version. I go and look at you play it live. Current to today, I want to see if the keys change to back in the day and everything yeah. in between. Yep. And I noticed you guys, and I love this video. I watched this performance like three times. Hmm. I love it so much because it's from Woodstock 99, oh. July 22nd from 99. You, you're you up there. Me. 
You're killing me, dude. And I'm killing you probably because you cringe at the performance. And you oh, know what? So it was. Yeah. You know what happened that day? It was four months before the single hit. Yeah. Now you right. you. In four months, you as people didn't change. You're the same people. The song's the same. The song's already recorded. And I'm watching this video, looking at people with folded arms going, okay, impress me, guy. And four months later, you're the biggest band on the radio. What was that like? (laughs) It's it's interesting that you put it that way. I mean, it was, yeah. So so the the Woodstock, my my sort of head in my hands moment there is really about the the fashion choices and the uh <laughs> me feeling the need to use expletives uh every other word as a as a burgeoning front man like trying to figure out what what it means to front a band you know i, I it was a role that i was definitely learning feeling my way into um but yeah no it was a it, that was the sort of moment when you know that time period was when it kind of all shifted from us just slugging it out in, uh, uh, like you said, coffee shops and, and small clubs, and then uh, getting really shot out of the cannon. RCA really believed in us and and put all their resources behind us and gave us the shot. And um, the beautiful thing was that the the song connected and resonated with people. And I mean, actually, that that day, it's it, it's it is a kind of glimpse into what our lives were going to be like because I recall needing to get into Woodstock super early in the morning. And then I think they would, they put us on some sort of private plane that like, this was not, let's be clear. This was not like the G five. This was like a prop <laughs> plane. You know what I mean? No, we like barely got our stuff into probably barely got off the ground because of the weight limitations or whatever, but it was a plane. Okay. Fair enough. You know, we had to fly to, wherever it was that we had our next gig that night you know so we we played woodstock in the morning and then played played another gig that night and that was kind of a you know a glimpse into sort of what our lives would become the chaos of it all and also like there wasn't a whole lot of time to stop and smell the roses as you know Mm -hmm. i know you you know what i'm talking about where it's like you know, in hindsight, you look back and you go, wow, that was a magical time, but I can't really remember that much of it. Yeah, a lot of it we can't remember, and I'm holding up my, my cell phone right now, is everything's yeah. right here. Back then, we were trapped in a van. I've talked about this on the show a lot. Yeah. Uh, I missed a lot of current events from back then. I missed TV shows and sitcoms and movies. I, w- I was trapped. I learned That's about really that, s- that that stuff later. But It's like you were an astronaut up on the dark side of the moon. <laughs> yeah, but I again, I, I love... I love this story here because I know that when I saw that Woodstock episode, you guys already had the album in the can. It was ready to go. The album, I believe, yeah. was was about to be out. What did the label feel like? What did your uh, family and friends, your close friends who don't BS you, they're going to tell you what you know the, the truth about your songs? And most importantly, what did the band think? Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of us knew or felt that everything you want would do what it did. I don't think you would dare to dream that it would do what it did, right? I think I knew as a writer that there was a nice moment when that reveal of the the pronoun shifted from he's everything you want, he's everything you need, et yeah. cetera, the chorus to I am everything you want, I am everything you need. I did feel that there was a nice reveal there and a lift and energy thing happened towards the end of the song, which felt kind of special, but it certainly wasn't. There were, there were no dreams of, hey, this is going to become a number one song. This is going to change our lives forever. None of that, right? But as far as what the band felt, I, I think we knew, look, we were, we were desperate, right? We had been pounding it out for seven years or something like that on the road in, in not even just in vans, but in like Jeeps. You know what I mean? And and selling the CDs on the side of the stage after the show was over. So w- there was an element, certainly for me, of like, I'm not sure how much longer I can do this. Like, I, I, you know, seven years is a long time to be banging your head against a brick wall. And so when we were given the opportunity to sign with RCA and then make the record that we made, and, and you and I both know that getting signed to a major label doesn't necessarily mean that you're everybody thinks of it or thought of it back then. Let's say this. I don't think I think things have, everything's changed since then. But back back then, in the, at the time, that was the dream. You were like, if only we could get signed to a major label. Well, that really is just the first step because 
then everything else needs to connect. And what are the odds of that happening? Not good at all, right? But my, I know my, my family was really excited about it. I felt like we made a record that was honest and true to who we wanted to be, not necessarily who, what we had been as a band, because we started as an acoustic duo, my, myself and Keith Kane, and we, we played shows, you know, together, just the two of us for a very long time. And that wasn't where I had come from as a musician. I had always played in bands. I had played electric guitar in bands, but Vertical Horizon really almost out of ease of of use was was two guys with acoustic guitars like it was it was easy to walk down from our apartment in georgetown to the club that we used to play on on thursday nights or whatever with acoustic guitars versus with a drum set and a bass rig and you know what i mean and it was literally that kind of a decision it's easier to do it this way and then it became then it became well that's who we are well is that who we are i that's who we were and for lots of reasons but who do we want to be I feel like Everything You Want was the record where we really inhabited who we wanted to be as a band. I love it. Well, the album was produced, co-produced by Mark Endert and uh, Ben, is it uh, Grossy or Gross? Gross. Ben Gross. Ben Ben Gross. And uh, Mark, uh, his credits, geez, he's worked with Fiona Apple on title, Madonna Ray of Light, uh, Ricky Martin self-titled. Ben uh, has worked with everyone from Dream Theater to Ben Folds and Filter. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So pretty, uh, pretty good little resume with those guys. So yeah, the record was released June 15th of 1999. Everything You Want was the second single release from the album reaching number one on the Hot 100 and becoming Billboard's most played single in the year 2000. I believe it. The song was absolutely everywhere. It's yeah. track number three of 11 on the album. Four singles total were released from the album. You're a God also hit number 23 on the Hot 100. That song is awesome. And Man, your prowess as a guitar player, I had no idea for this song, this song in particular, that you're playing all those little delayed hammer-ons on on the main riff of this song. It is so, so cool. I want to jump into this track. It's four minutes and 17 seconds. My producer Chris and I, Matt, were just talking yesterday about songs that are instantly recognizable. And mm, yeah. off the top of my head, it's like free falling from Petty. That first sure. chord, you just you just know. Uh, I'm going to throw this, uh, this song in, in that hat as well. This guitar part is its own uh-huh. beast. It's its Thank own you. thing. Uh, you hear it, you know uh, exactly what it was. Uh, and before we uh, start combing through this, I want to give a shout out to yourself and, and uh, the producers of this record. Uh, I've said this before. It only sounds dated to me, but because I know when it was released, this production <laughs> this production sounds awesome, and I, I'm oh, assuming yeah. uh, was it to tape or Pro Tools or a combo of both? Uh, it was all the basic tracks and guitars to tape. No, all the basic tracks, so uh, drums and bass to tape, and then I think we started uh, recording the guitar overdubs and vocals to Pro Tools. Because we were all convinced that that drum ta- uh, tape saturation was going to make a big difference back then. <laughs> yeah. I just remember for wait. I remember waiting for like 45 minutes every day in the morning for the stupid tape machine to align. And I know it's like, I know it's cool. Tape is cool and all that. It's also like in the morning, you're just, once you've recorded in Pro Tools, you're like, can't we just get going? You know? Yeah. I had uh, Tom Lord Algae one time. I know Tom mixed some of your stuff and we, yes. we're sitting down we're sitting down in his studio in South Beach in Miami and we're talking about that exact thing. He's like, yeah, you got these guys wanting to go and record stuff because for tape saturation on, on tape. He's like, the minute you put stereo guitars bass and a, and a ripping yeah. vocal over it, you're never yeah. going to hear what you, th- you think you're hearing. Uh, this yeah. intro... <laughs> This intro is eight bars of what I'm calling the riff. Uh, talk about instantly knowing a song. This riff embodies that as soon as it starts. Uh, this delayed clean guitar is then joined for another eight bars by an acoustic guitar. And at the end of the intro, both guitars stop before verse one. Somewhere there's speaking it's already coming in Oh, and it's rising at the back of your mind You never could get in Unless you were fed in And now you're here and you don't know why But under skin knees and the skid marks Past the places where you used to learn Wait for the echoes of angels that won't return. 
Somewhere there's speaking. It's already coming in. Oh, and it's rising at the back of your mind. You never could get it unless you were fed it. Now you're here and you don't know why. But under skinned knees and the skid marks, past the places where you used to learn, you howl and listen. Listen and wait for the echoes of angels who won't return. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty. Uh, that, that's a kid who's, who's playing with poetry there. So, so this song, really, the, the lyrics and the verses are a lot about. It, it's almost like uh, little snapshots of uh, moments and feelings, and some of them. So, so the overarching thing, I think, it's probably important to, for me to sort of mention. I was in love with a woman, with a girl who who like really in love with her, and she thought of me as her friend and. She made all these bad choices, guys that treated her poorly and would sort of come and cry on my shoulder. And so I was just sort of dying to get her to see me in a slightly different way. And so the so so that's sort of the overarching theme of the song. And and the lyrics and the verses, especially in verse one, is about the feelings that I was having, or maybe we even switch, like the main character is having. Uh but that but it's sort of it's sort of bouncing back and forth without being clear about it between the the main character and then the the love interest and it's sort of it's sort of things that she felt that she saw and things that he felt and he saw i'm not sure it's interesting as i think about this i'm not sure how comfortable i will be with like giving the decoder ring to lyrics in this, <laughs> in this song. You know what I mean? I, it's not, it's not really how I um, sort of like music to be experienced personally. So um, I guess I'd probably maybe even want to like look a little bit more macro at it. Um, okay. I'm happy to, I'm happy to comment on lyrics, but probably, I probably won't want to go go too deep. Well, I mean, what you, I, what you did when you read them, maybe I should just not expect myself to then get get granular on on each line. You know what I mean? How do other people do it? You know, th- this is I'm, I'm smiling ear to ear because out of I think we're over 220 some episodes right now. And I say this with the utmost respect. I've never had anybody actually say that to me. And I'm really surprised no one has. Oh, wow. And that is a perfectly, that's a perfect response. Hey, I'm going to tell you the the macro outline of what's going on here, but right. these are, these are my lyrics and, and you yeah. can take, you can take away what you want. That's really interesting. And I back that a hundred percent. Cool. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it was really about, it was about feelings. I, so I started writing this song at around four o'clock, four thirty in the morning. I woke up, I had, I had the, the guitar riff, uh, the intro riff, that thing in my head. And then I rolled over and I went back to sleep. I was like, I, I, I'll get it in the morning. I'll remember it in the morning. And then the same thing with the guitar chords and everything. And then the chorus came and it was this revelation like, oh my gosh, I can, I can, write, I can write about her. I can, I can sing about her. I can finally sing about her. And so the beginning of the song is kind of referencing this dream that's happening to me and this, you know, waking up. The song is, is kind of pounding its way into my head. Uh, and then it's reanimating all these, these memories, these uh, feelings that I had for this amazing girl. We hear the word thrown around a lot with songwriters, how it's cathartic. But if there ever yeah. was such, such a case, that sounds like what was going on here. Like you're, yeah. you're fi- you finally crossed the line of, hey, I, I can live again. I can actually sing about this. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not stifled by it. Yeah. I, and I also think with songs too, it's like sometimes, I mean, you know, if it doesn't resonate with you, you, you better not put it on a record because mm-hmm. you're going to have to sing it a thousand times or 2000 times in your career. And if you don't like it and you don't believe in it, then shame on you. Cause you know, you've caused, you've caused your own destruction. Well, I, f- I think you, you just answered it. I'm, I'm assuming this was written for this record because, Oh yeah. You know, you, yeah. Okay. It, it was. Cause you guys have been out playing for seven years. This might've been a song you had in your back pocket, but this was no. specifically written. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I went through this like feverish RCA was, was sort of on the, they were on the fence and another album, another label that was sort of 
romancing us at the time was sort of they were both on the fence about us and they were sort of like well what else give us some new songs let's hear what you're writing now and i wrote we are you're a god best i ever had and everything you want and and basically was like well this is what i'm writing now and that's when they were both like oh well okay let's let's try to let's try to make this happen did you hear hear anybody from the label at the time prior to it being released as a single saying this is a hit a and r person radio guy anybody uh, uh yeah. champion for it i mean i know that um <laughs> there there was a station in birmingham alabama when we were when we were when, when we are was the first single <laughs> they were like yeah we are is fine but we're going to start playing everything you want because that's the song and and it was like what okay I guess you can, I mean, you're ready you do whatever you want to do. And once everything you want became the single, it kind of, yeah, it was clear like that it was, that it was, that it was connecting and resonating, but no, I don't recall anybody in the radio department or any, you know, the hires up going, Hey, this is a slam dunk kind of thing. And frankly, it wasn't a slam dunk thing. I mean, this song held the record for a while. I'm not sure that it still does. It probably doesn't. The song that took the longest to climb the charts to reach number one. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. So so wow. it wasn't it wasn't like I mean it was ubiquitous in that it was being played seemingly all the time, thankfully, but it was also just inching its way up the chart. You look you look back at that period, it's like it seems like you guys came out of nowhere. It's like all of a sudden MTV yeah. was ushering you into the homes of people's living rooms, you were on yeah. the radio and you know, now with Wikipedia and, and uh, information at our fingertips, I can go back and look. And that's why I, I really related to this story. I'm like, OK, th- this wasn't an overnight success by any means. No, and, and, I, yeah. and, and, and I didn't bring it up to embarrass you in any way. I, I brought up the Woodstock thing. I absolutely loved watching that. It made me go, <sighs> hi, you suckers out there. You, you wait <laughs> for four more months. You, you know, yeah, you, you, you're going to be telling everybody I saw that band before they were they were a household name. I love I love stories like that. I absolutely love it. Well, that's a nice perspective on it, Chris. I appreciate that. I just can't get over the shirt and the pants myself. <laughs> well, halfway through verse one, a deep drum tom hit halfway through, uh, and the drums and bass are now in for the rest of verse one, as well as a shaker. Uh, and then we get a, a couple of really subtle harmonies on the back half on skid mm. marks and on listen. They're very subtle, very buried. And it almost sounds like the back half here of verse one the vocals are doubled to where you're kind of having a harmony come in here and there and, and, and right. not. Is that, if that um, so yeah, the harmony is Keith Kane and his voice. Um, I, I just adore his voice is just magic. You know, it's like this, I mean, you can hear it in the choruses too. He's saying, well, yeah, I know, we'll, I know we'll get there, but uh, his harmony's there. I don't think that the, I don't think we doubled the, my lead vocal there. I think the first time the lead vocal is doubled is in the bridge, if I recall correctly, because I did look at this fairly recently with my friend Christian James Hand. And I think I even said at one point, yeah, we doubled my vocal. And then I listened back to it later and I was totally wrong. So, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I may, I may be wrong here because chorus one uh, hits us at the minute and two second mark. And I'm hearing, unless you're just considering a lead vocal with backing vocals, but I'm hearing like a triple vocal here, like your vocal centered and then a couple of unison vocals, one okay. panned off left and one panned off right. You know what? Let's let's let it be a mystery, Chris, because I <laughs> at this point, it's you're 25 gonna, you're... years. You tell me, baby. I I believe anything. I haven't said this in a while. I used to joke uh, joke around a lot and, and say to other artists, "What you don't listen to your own music all day long?" And no, we don't. Yeah. So twenty five no. years ago, we're we're gonna say the 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 vocals are tripled here. We get a nice lead vocal up in center, and we get some panned vocals. And again, I'm hearing almost like I had to listen to this like fifty times. I'm squishing the 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 yeah. uh, head, headphones into my ears, going. Are there harmonies here or am I hearing yeah. unison? It sounds all unison though. So it's actually a harmony. I can say this with certainty. What what it is is Keith is singing, he's singing a static note. So um, he's everything you want, he's everything you need, he's everything inside of you that you wish you could be. That's his part. That's and so why. I sing, he's everything you want, he's everything you need. So we have a we have a 
a note that we're joined, that we're together on, and then I, the, ma- the main vocal sort of drops off of it. And I love harmonies like that. I do that all the time. I, I adore it. Like parallel thirds, which are so the sort of like official uh, approved harmony vocal, the Duriger choice. I love, I love having a static line that you can sort of just play off of. I think that might be like my go back to my Chris Squire and, you know, his harmony vocals in Yes. Oh, my just yeah. ab- absolute love for Chris Squire's voice. Yes. Um, you'll hear that in, in You're a God, too. Uh, I mean, it happens It happens in a lot of our songs. It's interesting. You got this little poppy chorus, but there's this underlying tension there from that static note that, that's yes. getting it. It, it yes. just kind of kind of gives it a little bit of your, you know, this sounds really pretty, but why am I on edge almost? <laughs> yeah, because so because the intervals start to rub. It's, yeah. it's very It's very kind of not pop approved really right right i i absolutely love it well drums bass guitar and acoustic guitar are now joined by a pair of overdriven stereo guitars here in chorus one sitting perfectly in the mix uh and this is such a great sing-along chorus we also have a tambourine and a shaker come in here on chorus one to keep everything moving along He's everything you want. He's everything you need. He's everything inside of you that you wish you could be. He says all the right things at exactly the right time, but he means nothing to you and you don't know why. I mean, this is classic friend zone, man. And there's nothing, there's nothing worse than friend zone when you love this person so much and you just see him making the same bad decisions yeah. over and over again and coming and crying to you. That is frustrating. Yeah, it was really, really hard. But it's also this, you know, the, what, what does it say? It's like the immovable object, you know, it's like you can't, you cannot make it shift. You can't what, bring a horse to water. Like it, it's not going to happen as much as you want it, as much as you dream of it and want it to. And you can love all you want, but if it doesn't come back to you, then there's nothing. But it was really interesting because I, I, she talked to me about this guy and that guy and what this guy did and what that guy did and how she thought he was great, but he was also kind of a jerk and and you know and her heart was still empty, you know, even when she was with these guys that she thought were perfect and you know sort of jumping up and down in the corner, you know, banging my head against the wall, going like, what the. What about me? Well, one more thing of note in chorus one that I love. I love that when you say he's, that's still in the verse. The downbeat is everything when the chorus oh, yeah. comes in. You're right. everything. Yeah. And I love that because I feel that it hits harder on that. And these are prior to this podcast, I knew what the downbeat of a chorus was and different things. I never really thought about it until I really zoned in like this. And I went, sure. yeah, it's a, it's a very, what seems like a small detail, but it means everything. No pun intended to me, how mm. that hits everything yeah, that, you want. Yeah. It's interesting. You put it that way. Cause it is, it's the title of the song and it probably does make it stronger. I have to be honest with you. I have never thought about it. Uh, that way until you just mentioned it. So very well played, sir. And I often wonder, I often wonder of little things like that. Is that the difference between making something a hit single? Because hit songs, man, they're hard right. to come by. Yeah. You, well, one of the things that I have thought about in regards to this chorus over time is it's very, there's there's almost a quality like a um, like a children's lullaby to it. If you think of the, cadence of the lyrics it's very much you know like like something that that you could hear on a uh, what do they call it the thing that they put up on the uh, above a baby's crib oh you know? yeah uh-huh yeah it'll have mary had a little lamb and whatever other yeah song on there. <laughs> it's, it's it is it's very kind of mary had a little lamb and like you know sing song he's everything you want He's everything you need. He's everything inside of you that you wish you could be. I mean, if you think about it that way, this song and maybe, I don't know, but like maybe some of its universality, 
uh, universality. I don't know which one. It's probably universality. But, you know, could possibly be also the cadence of those lyrics. That yeah, that form is very like sing along. It's like it, it. It's sort of how we were taught to sing along. Well, there's studies that have been done about the BPM of dance songs, and they right. look at them and this many bars, and look at how many songs are like this. There is uh, yeah. some science to us. Producer Chris just popped in. I think he's going to tell us what that uh, toy in the crib is called because oh, I can't Chris. think of it. <laughs> I believe that's called a mobile. I think that's mobile. How you it. Mobile. What? That's it. Mo- mobile. Mobile. No, he's is he right. That's what they call a cell phone in England. A mobile. I, but and that's and that's why we don't know about them anymore because <laughs> the stupid cell phone took it away. No, but he's absolutely right. And 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 I don't know if that's a thing that happens anymore for kids. Yeah. But like when we were kids, when I was a kid in the in the seventies, you know, yeah, you had that little thing and it w- 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 like a little music box kind of melody. And I do think there's a an element to this song. And the chorus in particular, that has a a little bit of that, like, you know, children's lullaby cadence. And and I'm also, I'm happy to say, you know, you mentioned all the scientific studies about BPMs and this and that. And (laughs) I'm thrilled to tell you that there were no scientific studies conducted in the creation of this song. I wasn't going to ask that, but Matt, I'm glad (laughs) glad you clarified. Hey, everybody, don't go anywhere. We got lots more coming up with Matt Scano after a few words from our sponsors. Looking to elevate your music career? DistroKid is a digital music distribution service that enables musicians to distribute their music to online stores and streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube Music, Amazon, Tidal, and many more. DistroKid collects earnings and payments, sending them to you, the artist. With DistroKid, artists unlock a world of possibilities. From easily paying collaborators with splits to securing your music with DistroLock, DistroKid covers all bases. Plus, you can promote your releases with HyperFollow and create eye-catching visuals with a Spotify Canvas generator, all for free. But that's not all. Introducing the DistroKid app, now available on iOS and Android. Artists can manage their releases, view streaming stats, and withdraw earnings, all from the palm of their hand. And for those looking to perfect their sound, check out Mixia. With its simple interface and customizable mastering options, artists can make their music sound polished and professional within minutes. And don't forget about Instant Share, DistroKid's newest feature. Share large files securely with collaborators, producers, and more, ensuring your music streams at the highest quality. Ready to take your music to the next level? Download the DistroKid app and explore their suite of tools today. Plus, listeners can enjoy 30% off their first year by visiting distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. That's distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. With Amex Platinum, you can really be in the now. Access to Resi Priority Notify. Yes. 4 p.m. checkout with fine hotels and resorts booked through Amex Travel. <sighs> we needed this. And dedicated card member entrances at select events. Let's go. Means you can focus on the present moment. That's the powerful backing of American Express. Terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. Card member entrance access not limited to Amex Platinum card. Hey, friends. Have you been loving Krista Makes a Podcast? Well, spread the love by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't hesitate to share what you enjoy about the show in an actual written review on Apple Podcasts. Not only does it help more people discover us, but we often read reviews in the rap segment of the show. It's a quick, cost-free way to support us and takes just a minute of your time. Your reviews mean the world to us and help us keep the podcast thriving. Thank you for being a listener and thank you for being a friend. And now, back to the show. 
right out of chorus one. We're in an eight bar full band reintro, and we are now joined by an arpeggiated guitar part panned off right. I love that guitar. Whatever Thank you, you had, whatever you had on it, it's just it's so subtle, but it, it's perfect for the reintro. The theme is still there from the top, but you're just introducing a little bit of ear candy. So that guitar, um, and it's it's appropriate because uh, he, you know, rest in peace, he just passed away. Jim Tyler, uh, one of the great uh, luthiers of, of our time, as far as I'm concerned, his, his company, James Tyler Guitars, I had a, uh, a Jim Tyler Classic, which is sort of a, a, an S-type guitar. And that, so that sound was the Tyler in the second position. So the bridge humbucker and the middle pickup together it was you know a strat strat style guitar with two single coils and a, and a bridge humbucker and and it was the the second position up uh from the bridge so that kind of clucky mark knopfler dire straitsy kind of sound yeah. with a um almost like a, a rotary chorus pedal and i think it might have been an Arion stereo chorus and a uh, prescription electronics univibe the the real the real sort of chewy almost phasery kind of sound in that part is is this unit this vibe unit of a prescription electronics vibe unit that i just adore i see you're a, you're a, a guitar nerd disguised as a vocalist because you couldn't oh, tell me man. you couldn't you couldn't tell me if you tripled your vocals but you just told me a pedal setup yeah. from 25 years ago well chris that's because we're talking <laughs> about the important stuff now <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ah, now, I, now, now I got your number. Now I got you. Now I, now I got you on the line, Matt. Well, That's uh, funny. after this eight-bar full band reenter, we go into verse two. You're waiting for someone to put you together. You're waiting for someone to push you away. There's always another wound to discover. You're waiting for someone to put you together. You're waiting for someone to push you away. There's always another wound to discover. There's always something more you wish he'd say. We got the same overall instrumentation here as verse one, but we get some subtle but awesome vocal harmonies. We get a harmony on you together, on push you away, on wound to discover, and on wish he'd say on the last line. Well, what's happening here in verse two? This is really a little bit more direct things that I would love to say to her that I probably won't have the guts to say. So I put it in the song and sing it 2000 times in my life. And incidentally, uh, I've never told her that this song was about her. So she still oh my doesn't, gosh. she still doesn't know. And I never will. Like it's, I'm happy for it to, to, to not be a, Re- revealed in that in that sense but uh but yeah you know it was just almost a more observational like you're waiting for someone to save you and hurt you and it's never it's never right it's never you know you, you might think it is but this mr perfect is never perfect um and the harmonies are again it's keith kane just the beautiful tonality of his voice especially in that lower register it just sounds really deep and full. I love it. I think uh, verse two is great. And something I didn't mention, verse two is uh, a half a verse as compared uh, to verse one. Off the heels of verse two, we get into chorus two. Same overall instrumentation and vocal placement as chorus one. Say he's everything you want. He's everything you need. He's everything inside you. And I wrote here in the notes I, with a smiley face. I said, "Why mess with it yet?" <laughs> and what I what I meant with that was is we're going to yeah. get a lyric change on the back half of chorus three, as we know. Yeah. Which I, I I think that you know you had kind of mentioned a, a little bit earlier, and we're we're going to get there. But uh, I can't state enough how powerful it is when it changes to I there. Thanks, we're man. we're, we're going to get there. But as yeah. a, as someone that strives to be a better lyricist, when I read stuff like that, and on paper, 
It looks so simple. I've said yeah. that before. Look at look at hit songs sometimes. Look at Taylor Swift's lyrics. There yeah. is no filler. There's no yeah. filler. It's it's all content. It all means something. And uh, this uh, this song's fantastic when it changes uh, changes at the back half. But uh, outside of chorus too, we come into this bridge, which this may be my favorite part of the song. But oh, thank it you, takes. Man. It takes you so far away from the rest of it, which sometimes bridges should do, but yeah. uh, it, it almost feels like you're in a different different place for a second because those vocals go up an octave here. It really, yeah. really lifts this bridge. Drums, bass, stereo guitars, acoustic guitar, shaker, and tambourine are here. But you'll just sit tight and watch it unwind. It's only what you're asking for, and you'll be just fine with all of your time. It's only what you're waiting for. And I'm before you go on, I, I, I want to hear what these are about. I'm researching your band, and, and, and you're considered, uh, on Wikipedia at least, a, an alternative band. How, how do you describe yourselves? And, and I say that because... Uh, you know, to me, you guys were just a, a 90s pop band, but there's there's so much more under the hood here. I think at the time, it was the kind of definition. It's what you called a band that you didn't really know wh- how to categorize them, right? Yeah. What what section are we going to put in the record store? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and so like we weren't heavy metal, you know, we weren't pop. We, you know, they're all, they're, there were all these things that we weren't, but you weren't grunge. We, <laughs> yeah, we weren't grunge. So I guess we're alternative, you know? And, uh, yeah, I, I still don't understand it. It's, it's, I, I do everything I can do. Uh, I'm, and I'm saying this facetiously, but I do everything I can do to make us uncategorizable. I just let us be us, you know? I mean, yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, I feel like this is a rock song. Uh, and certainly in the bridge, it's definitely a rock song. Well, and I, I never bring up tags for bands or what the media attached to them or anything. And I only yeah. brought it up here because it's just it's interesting when I go back and, and, and listen to this song in particular, you know, prior to really getting it here and, and, and getting it under the microscope, it was just kind of like this pop song. But again, there's right. a lot, a lot more going going on here, especially this bridge. What's happening here uh, lyrically? The beautiful thing about a bridge in a song is it's sort of you were allowed to sort of step outside what has come before. Yeah, I think of it as, as if a song is a structure, you're walking into a new room and it sort of can give you some different perspective on where you've been. And I think lyrically, this is the main character kind of taking a step back from her and looking, looking at her patterns and looking what what she's doing, what she continues to do. It's not really judgy. It's not. I don't think it's trying to be judgy. It's more like this is just <clears throat> this is how you're living. You know, this is what you're doing. And I think one of the things that's nice about the bridge probably is is that big, great big pause at the end. You know, it's only what you're waiting for, and then we literally kind of make you wait for verse three. And I was going to ask, is that what that wait was for? That pause is that is that yeah. a play on is, is that a play on the lyrics? You just answered my question. Yeah. I, that's awesome. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> That didn't hit me until you just uh, just said it. Yeah, it was sort of like once I hit that lyric, I knew that it's only what you're asking for. And I felt and I I hardly ever like to rhyme a word with 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 the word. So by putting waiting for ending ending both of those lines with the word for kind of irked me a little bit. But then I realized it's just it's just what I needed to say. And and so putting the pause in there made it kind of like it it's almost like i was earning repeating for i don't know if this is going to make any sense well no i think it does and i and and you hold out for there too which makes yeah. it different from when you said for prior yeah yeah uh, it's nice of you to say i i as a, as a as a songwriter it's 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 like no you can't do that you can't do that until you can do that. And there are and every now and again, I think there's an occasion when you, you can do it, but you, this is it. You can do it, but you have to earn it. 
And I think that we, I, as, as the songwriter, I earned it in the way that we sort of crafted that, that pause there. That's a great way to put it. Well, the vocal and the band hold out uh, for this pause to set up verse three. And am I hearing, along with all the aforementioned instruments uh, here for the bridge, am I also hearing like descending piano notes panned off right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Jamie, Jamie Mahalbrook's playing. Uh, it's so cool. It's a Rhodes part. And actually, you know, in the mixing of this record and every record, you know this, it's like, what do we have to bury so that, what do we have to kill so that other things may live? <laughs> you know? Ah, yes. And, and, and so, so Jamie's beautiful descending chordal part. And also there's this gorgeous, I think the Rhodes part is actually in the chorus. It's, it's in there, in the soup, subtly making the spices a little bit more palatable, but, but it's not front and center. And, no, and that, is, no. that is the sort of unfortunate battle of mixing by the same token, I think it's it, it it rewards and encourages multiple listenings and getting the headphones on and like you said, smushing them to your head and and like really diving in, you know. And I love I love that the, the the track itself isn't that complicated. It's not that mean, meaning the song itself isn't the session isn't that deep in terms of its number of tracks. Right. It's, it's actually surprisingly sparse, but. Uh, but there are nonetheless some things that that well, I, I seem to recall when we pushed some of those keyboard parts louder, the sort of the intensity of the song started to to lull a little bit. And, the, and the, so we decided to, well, let's lean into the guitars, let the guitars kind of keep us at a, at a more maybe a, a, a heightened, uh, you know, a little bit more intense uh, the song needs to be intense. And it all depends on the song and what you're trying to get across. I can't tell yeah. you how many times it's like, you know what? We're going to put two more guitar stereo guitars here on the bridge. It's going to make it bigger. And it doesn't yeah. make it bigger. It makes everything else sound smaller for some yeah. reason. Yeah, you sometimes know? it does. Yes. But then totally. the, the, nec the next song, you try that trick and it works. It's it's interesting how that happens. Yeah. Uh, verse three uh, comes right out of the bridge. The shaker is noticeably louder here in verse three. And halfway yeah. through, another guitar panned off right joins us playing a new melody it's beautiful mm -hmm. whatever's happening there on, on on that guitar uh is awesome thank you chris out of the island into the highway past the places where you might have turned never did notice but you still hide away the anger of angels who won't return out of the island into the highway, past the places where you might have turned. You never did notice, but you still hide away. The anger of angels who won't return. Yeah, this is, this, I mean, it still gets me, actually. I just, this whole thing was like my feeling defeated, feeling like, like she was going away. I was losing her. And the things that we could have had were disappearing. And it just really got me. It still gets me to this day. But uh, yeah, uh, that's what that yeah, that's what that was. Well, I, I, that last line is just awesome. The anger of angels who won't return. Uh, I, I could see that lyric being uh, with a multiple choice. What band wrote these lyrics? It'd be, it'd, it'd be Slayer, uh, Slayer, Mor Morbid Angel, Sepultura, and Vertical Horizon. And I don't oh. think any, I don't think anybody'd pick Vertical Horizon. But, that uh, <laughs> is hilarious, Chris. God, I love that you just said that. That's so good. <laughs> well, we get, we get. I'm not laughing at you, Matt. I'm laughing. No, with you. I think it's okay. magic, man. That's perfect. My God. Uh, verse three, we get harmonies on the highway. Might have turned, hide away, and won't return. Uh, and then we get uh, this uh, nice new drum fill there that takes us into chorus three. Return. He's everything you want.
The first half, we get the same lyrics. Why mess with it? Because we know what's going to happen here <laughs> on the second half. Uh, chorus three, the tambourine panned off left. For whatever reason, I A-B'd chorus one and two. I swear it's louder here. That is a trick sometimes with mixers to kind of make everything mm-hmm. sound bigger at the end. And then we get in to the lyric change here where uh, everything changes to I. Uh, The first four times, again, it sounds like some unison and some words are harmonized here. It's probably that that one Mm -hmm. holdout note you were talking about that I'm still hearing here. And then we get some harmonies on the back half, but here's the lyrics. I am everything you want. I am everything you need. I am everything inside of you that you wish you could be. I say all the right things at exactly the right time. But I mean nothing to you, and I don't know why. And I don't know why. Why? I don't know. That's funny when you read it out at the end. Why? I don't know. Well, (laughs) that's one of the biggest trips that people have when they come on the show is that I've never had my lyrics uh, read back to me. And and that's strange for musicians, right? Um, Was this the whole idea of the song? Yeah. When did you decide to go to I? Because it's genius. Well, thank you. Thank you. This was the whole song. And it was, it, I don't know that I knew it when I started writing it, but it was, it was the whole reason for the song in the first place. I remember when I made the demo, I was trying to figure out which pronouns to put in which choruses. You know, each chorus had a different pronoun in it. And I was trying to figure out architecturally, maybe like, how does it hold together the strongest? And it, and it was crystal clear, you know, as soon as I sort of thought it through listening to the demo, this, okay, this is how, it, this is how it works. But, but the, yeah, the whole payoff or meaning or reveal of the song is, is here in, in, in that pronoun shift. You know, it's like a, it's like a song that has a spoiler in it yeah like yeah you want it i mean that's really what you want it to feel like is like it's like a like a oh don't if you haven't heard the song i don't i don't want to let's not talk about it listen to the song and then and then that 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 pronoun shift and like by the way just because i have to say this like sometimes when i talk about these things and i talk about my songs and stuff i've done like i don't ever want to sound like some dude who's like digging himself because like Come on. Oh, well, I mean, well, I don't know. I just had a moment where, like, you know, like, whatever. Like, <laughs> this isn't, I didn't cure cancer. I wrote a stupid song. Thank you for being humble. Uh, I have, I oh, have man. had, I have had some, some guests say that. What I see is a guy that's as nerdy about his music as I am. I, I just, I love combing through other people's songs. Yeah, I've, had pe- cool. I've had people write me and say, Man, and, or they'll, they'll say to Chris, my producer, there's no way Chris can be this excited about every song. And I'm telling you, when I see the song from this way, and I don't yeah. listen to it like I've been listening to it for 25 years. I don't care what song it is. You see it differently when you're analyzing it. There's not sure. one song I've had. I've had songs on here that I didn't like. I might even have said 20 years ago, I hate that song. Sure. But, but when I look at it this way, I appreciate and I see the genius. We're all humans yeah. with our own fingerprint. I can't be you and you can never be me. Yeah, that, exactly. That that yeah. that is fascinating. And that's the same reason why, you know, how many songs have been written and it took uh, somebody to re-record it and cover that song to make it huge. Right, Something about right. their emotion, the way that they gave that song, it breathed, uh, it breathed life into it. And hey, yeah. as lyricists, we're always trying to say something that everyone can understand, but that hasn't been said before. And the way that you uh, change this back half up here, it, it's so cool. We get harmonies on, I say all the right things at exactly the right time, but I mean nothing to you, and I don't know why. That's the last harmonies. Uh, on the last uh, bit here, the out drum calling it. When you say, and I don't know why, why, and I don't know, drums, bass, and acoustic guitar panned off left, and the riff guitar. Riff guitar here is nice and loud panned off right. Halfway through, we get another guitar making some squeaky noise uh, panned, <laughs> off, panned off to the left before. Yeah. What is what is that? Was that like messing with a toggle yeah. switch or something? Or No. So that is a um, – so, so there's a – there's a pedal that Roger Mayer created for Jimi Hendrix called the Octavia. And oh. if you listen to, if you listen to, um, I think it's, I don't know off of band of gypsies. I mean, it's all over Hendrix's re- recordings, but my favorite Hendrix record is band of gypsies. And it has this 
strange, almost like ring modulator kind of quality to it. It's a fuzz pedal that has, as a component to the fuzz, an octave up above the note that you're playing. And okay. so I'm playing those parts just with this super spitty. It was mine is actually a, a prescription electronics sort of version of of the, the the Octavia, and it's just it's just getting this really staccato spitty. Uh, sound and the key with the Octavia and this is you don't care about this because this is me now being guitar nerd guy but like neck pickup on a especially a single coil neck pickup volume knob rolled back a little bit like to like eight or seven something happens where it just becomes the octave becomes more apparent and right. it, and it, it it has that kind of quality to it so so the the, the for me the key about that part was getting the pocket right. And, and as 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 a player, but speaking of pocket, I have to mention two guys that we haven't really mentioned at all during the discussion of this song, and that is Sean Hurley, the bass player, and Ed Toth, the drummer. Amazing, um, because the rhythm section in this song is truly world class. Like the the I I actually believe when I listen to this song now, I kind of just a lot of what I listen to is the sort of effortless deep comfy couch of a pocket that these guys have created <laughs> for for the guitars and the vocals i mean sean sean's part if you listen to this listen to the chorus and you listen to the bass line you can hear the way the bass line makes my vocal and my the, the lyrics in the chorus better because he goes to low octaves during moments of tension, and he makes the, he makes more tension by 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 he actually he tracked it with a five string guitar, which I know is a bass guitar, which is not like the cool guy thing. All the all the cool <laughs> guy bass players are like, no man, four strings are death. And um, but Sean sort of acquiesced and was like, no, no, we can, yeah, we'll we'll put because I think there was like a low D in there. And trying to recall the notes exactly, but 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 anyway, so 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 I just need to give props to those guys, you know, like Ed with his sort of Stuart Copeland the flourishes and his beautiful you know ride work, you know, playing the bell of a ride symbol uh, is a is a, uh, a dangerous a dangerous <laughs> thing. It, it can it can kind of take you out, or it can kind of make it just perfect. And his Ed's drum performance is just so good and the four on the floor kick drum in the in the bridge yeah um you know what i mean just i have to i have to give these guys props and love because they just killed this track i love that you said that because they they absolutely did uh yeah. this outro chorus backing up for a second i forgot and i have to ask you because it's just it's it's another really cool sound uh and this is the i am everything you want part when it gets around the line that you wish you could be before the vocal harmonies kick in it sounds Sounds like a banjo is plucking away <laughs> here, panned off right. No banjos were harmed during the recording of this song. Yeah, or maybe maybe an acoustic guitar with a uh, octave uh, pedal on it or something. It's a really unique. Or I got to thinking, yeah. it maybe that sound that comes in later, that squeaky sound. I'm thinking that maybe you were playing a different phrase using that squeaky sound. I so so to the best of my recollection, the squeaky sound track doesn't come in until the outro. Okay, I'm okay. trying. I'm trying to think. There was that vibe unit rotary chorus sound that comes in in the reintro after chorus one and uh and, and comes in in the outro of the song i do know that 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 guitar is sneaking and peeking in around a, a little bit but also there is bear in mind that that poor Rhodes part the fender Rhodes piano part that um that jamie mahobrick played is in that chorus and it's this really cool descending line so so it could be any of those things i wish i had i wish i was just listening uh, and i'd be able to maybe clarify but 
that may be what I'm hearing. Or Chris, or Chris, I'm lying to you, and it's a banjo. You, <laughs> it might be. You, you decide. You need to tell me if you think that maybe all that was BS, <laughs> and I didn't want to be called out for the real well, genius of this song, which was the hidden banjo track. I have a theory that producer Mark Endert is a world-class banjo player, and he snuck in yep. the studio late at night, and he did it without you knowing. But and, I didn't uh, even know about it. My my uh, <laughs> my my tuned ear here, being a podcast yeah. uh, guy, has picked it yes, out. Yes, sir. At the <laughs> at Love the very it. end, uh, we get twelve bars, about twelve bars uh, of a fade out with the main uh, guitar panned off right, and everything else kind of filtered and pushed back. And I wrote here the last thing I'm, uh, I have written down is that riff is so good you want to hear it to the last thing you hear, and it oh, really thanks, is. Buddy. It really yeah. is. It's 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 so good. Um, I love your story. Congratulations. Uh, very few bands uh, get to have a hit of this magnitude. And everybody that I have that comes on here, uh, my peers in the business, I always am very quick to, to congratulate them. It uh, doesn't Thank come you, easy. Man. So congrats to you and to you and the guys. A lot of people work really, really, really hard for, for, for us to have that number one next to this song. So it's like, you know, it was it, it took a village and then some. And I'm always uh, eternally grateful to the people who who really, really helped helped us uh, climb that that crazy, beautiful ladder. I love it. Well, you guys just finished a tour with the Gin Blossoms and Toad the Wet Sprocket, both of which been featured on the show before. We had Robin Wilson on to discuss uh, Till I Hear It From You, and we had Glenn Phillips on to discuss All I Want. Uh, nice. Also heard, also heard uh, your cover uh, with Toad of REM's Driver 8, which is killer. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, that was, that was Toad's idea, and I think it was just an awesome, awesome idea. Those guys are fantastic. I mean, what a band. What great people. And uh, it was a it was a joy for for I know I can speak for Robin. It was a joy for both Robin and and, and uh, myself to be asked to to sing on that song. And and I love Michael Stipe's poetry in that song. Man, woof, those lyrics are killer. Yeah, they're awesome. Before we break, anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with? What's uh, what's coming up on the horizon for Vertical Horizon? Yeah, so we're on the road a lot right now. I mean, it's the 25th anniversary of everything you want. Um, we're going to just keep celebrating it for, for you know, certainly for a little while longer. I don't know exactly, but we're out there. Um, and yeah, if you, if you, you know, we'd love for people to check us out on Instagram, um, at uh, official vertical horizon and Facebook is, uh, official vertical horizon as well. We're vertical horizon on Twitter, uh, X and, uh, and vertical horizon.com. And our tour dates should be up kind of on, on all of those things. I know, uh, we're out on the road, uh, um, you know, throughout November and December of this year. And so we'd love to, uh, have people come see us. Awesome, Matt. Hey, man, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk to me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, buddy. Thank you, Chris. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Matt Scannell. I know that personally, I now have a whole new level of appreciation for everything you want. And I can't wait to talk to Chris about it in the rap segment that's coming up right after a few words from our sponsors. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash campaign to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash campaign. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. This is the sound of your ride home with dad after he caught you vaping. Awkward, isn't it? Most vapes contain seriously addictive levels of nicotine and disappointment. Know the real cost of vapes. Brought to you by the FDA. Hey there, Krista Makes a Podcast listeners. Ready to take your podcast experience to the next level? By signing up for the supporting cast at KristaMakes.com. 
you not only ensure the continued production of our show, but also unlock exclusive perks. Subscribers receive a weekly bonus episode of our other podcast, The After Party, co-hosted by Chris Fafalius and myself. Many fans rave that The After Party is just as enjoyable as the main show. And with close to 200 music-centric episodes in the archive, there's a treasure trove of entertainment awaiting you. Thank you for tuning in and for your support in keeping the podcast going strong. Join us at KristaMakes.com and let's keep the fun conversations going. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's feature artist is The Meringues, a post-punk powerhouse from Kingston, Ontario. At the heart of the band are Amanda Pants and Ted Evans, supported by the rhythm section of Jackson Baird on the bass and Alistair Morrison on drums. Their latest full length is called Pavlova's Dog. Here's a snippet of their song, Royalty. Go tell your friends that she's the one it's really crazy. The Rap with Chris and Chris. Chris, I knew this was going to be a good episode, and I even told Matt this once it was over, but that moment where he said he didn't want to get too specific about the lyrics was so awesome, and he ended up talking plenty about the lyrics in the episode anyway. I don't think we expected him to get more specific than he did, but I, and I'm sure you, and I'm sure the listeners could hear in his voice just how much this song still means to him. Oh, yeah. You know, and he was talking about verse three, Chris, uh, somewhere around the line, the anger of angels. And he kind of looked down and he just had this look and he shook his head and he said, man, that that part will still get to me if I think about it. 25, 26 years later, and this is still hitting him enough to where... You know, he wa- he was going to give us a roundabout uh, version of what was happening here, but he wasn't uh, going into specifics. I love it. It's real deal. He was not phoning this song in then. And that real feeling, that real emotion came out and resonated with people so much that this song, you know, like he said, there were a lot of people along the way who helped get it there. But this became a number one song because you could feel that emotion. This should be a case study in writing from the heart and not so much writing to what you think people want to hear or what you think is popular at that moment, just writing from your heart. I, I love that. Yeah, you know, and he, he had talked about, uh, you know, the, the lyrics and, and how, you know, just even that uh, when he changes to I in, in, in the last chorus of mm-hmm. how that was thought out, how the part where they had the holdout, uh, you know, of silence, how that was thought out because the lyric that preceded was, it's only what you're waiting for. And man, I've thought of clever things in songs before, and it just clever things don't add up to a hit all the time. They just don't. If if they did, we'd have probably more hit songs. And it seems like there was some calculated things within this song that they all seemed to work. It was smart though. That changing it from he to then the payoff in the song is no. It's it's me. It's it's I. I think that that made it so relatable. In so many different ways that made it relatable. And uh, I think that's awesome. This kind of reminds me of, you know, Descendants, I'm the One. Once again, we're talking about that sort of place where you're friends with someone, but you want to be more. Some people will use that word friend zone. I've heard people kind of push back against using that term. But here's the thing, man. Anybody could be. I don't care if you're a a man, woman, or, or whatever. You could feel that way about somebody that doesn't feel that way about you. I feel like at some point we've all been in that position. Oh yeah. And as far as the production goes and, and I hats off to Matt, you know, he gave props to everybody, their bassist, their drummer, uh, former guitarist, vocalist, Keith Kane. He, he gave a shout out to Mark Endert and Ben Gross who produced the record. Uh, but you know, aside from knowing it's 25 years old, this thing sounds like it could be on the radio today. The production's awesome. Yeah. It sounds just as good as it did then. Another thing he said about this song, 
that I thought was interesting. I never really thought, I think this, uh, I'll tell you what, I think this about a lot of punk songs. Uh, but he talked about the cadence of the chorus being like a nursery rhyme. And I never really picked up on that in this song. There's a, there's some Blink songs out there I think that about. <laughs> but I didn't think that. But when he said that, I'm like, okay, maybe I can hear that a little bit. Well, and, and Blink's been used as an example of that many times, because and they are a good example, and I think it's one of the reasons why the band's so big. I had used Mary Had a Little Lamb as an example. Mary had a little, na, 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 na. If you listen to Blink's uh, melody lines, it's very, all the small things, na, 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 na. And there's something with that, okay? There's something that, that hit you over the head mentality. And I didn't think of that either until Matt brought it up with this song, but I can see where he was going with that. Yeah. Hey, I, I got to love the story of a band, like he said, selling CDs from the side of the stage and then signing to a major label and having a number one song, a band that paid their dues, toured, you know, really grinded it out for a long time. You know, I like that story a lot better than the stories of like overnight success. Well, and I even said to him, it seemed like, you know, back in 1999, 2000, that they came out of nowhere. They were shot out of a cannon. But, you know, being able to go and research where they came from, that is not the case. They were working uh, working really hard. He did say that no one was jumping up and down at the label, management, anybody. This was just kind of like a song, you know. He had written it, and uh, it wasn't until it was released as a single, uh, and they started getting rumblings. I guess that station, uh, I think he mentioned somewhere in Alabama, Birmingham, yeah. Alabama, that uh, said, "Yeah, the single's okay, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna play this track on the album." And that was a big deal back then. We had some radio stations that did that to less than Jake. It's like, well, if we're gonna go with this song. We're like, but we have a radio campaign with the other song, you know. So at least they were playing us on the radio, I guess. That's right, <laughs> Chris. The whole time I was waiting for that moment where he was gonna go, yeah, and the person who this song is about. She's my wife now, or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, the, the whole time I'm wondering, like, well, did it work? Yeah, and he even said he even said the person doesn't know it's about her, which I which know. I find absolutely mind boggling. Right? That's what I'm getting at. Is like when he said that, I was like, whoa! How could they, this is a number one song? How could they not? Could this person he's writing about be that blind to it to not like pick up on a lyric here and there or whatever because my i was wondering too like one of the questions i was going to ask is like hey when you're writing a song about somebody and the song becomes popular does that work do you then <laughs> <laughs> does it then work that you you get the person that you're you're writing about or, or you're now in a relationship or by the time the song does take off and become a popular song, do you not even care about that person anymore? Which has kind of been my experience on a smaller scale is like, hey, once you write a song about somebody and it's been out there for a while, it's like, I don't I, oh, who is that about? <laughs> but, but I love that this song is still so personal to him. And uh, I couldn't believe that reveal that whoever this song is about doesn't know. Yeah, well, I really enjoyed breaking this one down. And uh, make sure you go over to uh, Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Keep those coming. We appreciate it, as well as Spotify, because uh, you never know who's going to go read those uh, reviews, Chris, and stumble across our podcast and decide to give it a listen because of someone's uh, five-star review. And speaking of those five-star reviews, Chris, can I read you one? I would love to hear it. What do you got? I got one here from Enoch17, who said awesome and gave us five stars. And Enoch17 said, I love listening to this podcast and hearing all the little things that go into songs that I have never noticed and the stories behind the songs. Chris is a great host to put it all together. Highly recommended. Short and to the point and nice nonetheless. Was that Enoch73 you said? Enoch 17. Enoch 17. Thank you, Enoch 17, for that wonderful review. And everyone out there listening, thanks to you guys for tuning in each week. We really appreciate it. Go give us a uh, follow on Instagram. Uh, Krista makes a podcast over there. And give us a follow. And go over and join the Krista Makes a Podcast Facebook group. Over 5,000 members and counting. We have a lot of fun over there. Go check it out. And I want to thank this week's guest, Matt Scannell, for sitting in with us. And we'll see you next week. One Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. And we decide if they brought the One Hit Thunder or were nothing more than a one hit blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. 
Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. What makes a song a smash on the charts? Is it talent? Luck? Timing? Well, as chart analyst and pop critic Chris Melanfi would say, it's all that and more. Chris hosts Hit Parade, a podcast from Slate, where he tells tales from more than a half century of pop chart history. Through storytelling, trivia, and song snippets, he dissects how the artists you love or hate dominated the airwaves and shaped your memories forever. He's explained why Steely Dan is Yacht Rock and Jimmy Buffett isn't, why girl groups dominated the early 60s and boy bands the late 90s, how the members of disco band Chic wrote a bass line that launched hip-hop, how Taylor Swift pivoted from country to pop, how Sam Cooke invented soul and James Brown invented funk, and what exactly a one-hit wonder is, and whether the band AHA is a one-hit wonder. I think you'd really like it. So for tales of the hits from coast to coast, make sure to follow Hit Parade wherever you get your podcasts. Hello out there. Hi, I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. We want to tell you about our podcast, None But the Brave, which is dedicated to taking a deep dive into the work of Bruce Springsteen. We're currently in our fifth season. Our latest episodes focus heavily on Bruce's 2024 tour and have featured such guests as Anthony Castrovince from MLB Network and Barstool's Kirk Minahan. We're also covering the 40th anniversary of Bruce's biggest record, Born in the USA. And as part of that, coming up this week, Uproxx cultural critic Stephen Hyden returns to the show for a fascinating hour-long conversation about his new book, There Was Nothing You Could Do, Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA and the End of the Heartland. To listen, you can go to our website, mbtbpodcast.com, or subscribe on your preferred podcasting platform. We hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!